I'm Abby Mullen, and this is Consolation Prize, a podcast about the history of the United States in the world through the eyes of its consuls. Last week, we introduced you to three women whose lives intersected with the consular service of the 19th century. But we wanted to know how women can be involved in the consular service today. So recently, I sat down with Maura Hardy, who joined the Foreign Service in 1981. Over her multi-decade career, she served in Mexico, Spain, Colombia, and Paraguay. She also served in Washington, D.C. numerous times as an executive. In her final job at the State Department, she was the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Consular Affairs. Mora talked to me about how the consular service has changed over the course of her career, and about her experiences as a woman in the consular service. Before we jump in, a few things you should know. One, Maura spoke to me in her personal capacity, and nothing she says should be construed as the official opinion of the State Department. And two, the Foreign Service is made up of several divisions, which are called cones. A Foreign Service officer can serve in any one of the cones. So if you hear Maura refer to a cone, just think division or unit. Our main episode is about women who are, let's call them consul adjacent. Um, So wives of consuls who end up some, in some cases, acting like consuls or are sort of the support mechanism for their, their husbands. But I'm really excited to talk to you because of course, in the 20th and 21st century, now women can be consuls and women can be involved in the foreign service in a much more meaningful way. Sounds like you have been to a lot of interesting places. I'm sure that must be one of the the most interesting aspects of being in the Foreign Service is getting to go so many interesting places. Well, the world is en- endlessly interesting, right? And uh, with specific reference to the consular function, we're touching people's lives every day, whether it's sort of people who are seeking an immigration benefit or simple uh, tourist visa or student visa to American citizens abroad, uh, who as are, as the consuls that you have researched um, knew very well, are quite capable of getting themselves into pickles. You know, the funniest line I think a consul ever hears is, you won't believe what happened to me. And we believe anything because we've seen so much. People are endlessly resourceful at uh, getting themselves into jams, and we try to be equally resourceful in helping them out. Can you give me an example? What's the strangest thing that you've ever had to deal with? Gosh, um, that's a really high bar. The strangest thing I've ever had to deal with. Um, but I'll give you one of the first ones. I mentioned joining the Foreign Service in 1981. That was a couple of months after I graduated from undergraduate school. And so I was, what, 22 when what I'm going to recount happened. I was assigned to go do what we all do from time to time, uh, visit American citizens in jail. And I was eager to go do my job. Read up on the handful of Americans we had in a jail in the Mexican city of Oaxaca. And I, wanting to be compassionate as well as professional, bought some cases of cigarettes and I baked and I bought magazines. Those things aren't necessarily normal, and there's no budget for that. So just to to put that aside for anybody who thinks, my tax dollars, no, no. So off I went. And when I got to the prison, all of 22 years old, I'm five foot nothing, sort of of slight. The Mexican guards insisted that that they needed to strip search me before I could go in, and that I couldn't take in any packages. And I just called their bluff just went into the, you know, I am America. I am the embassy. You are not going to strip search me. I will show you what's in the packages that I'm bearing, but they're not for you. And this went on for quite some time. Uh, And finally, they probably got bored with it or realized I really wasn't going to let any of those things happen. So uh, they said, okay, okay, you can see them. And follow me, says one guy. So I follow him right into the courtyard 
where there's probably 300 men. No, nothing like sort of what you see in a movie where you go into a small room and you meet who you're going to meet or something like that. So I thought, well, <laughs> I started to turn to the guy to say, you know, where where do I go? You know, this isn't a good place for meeting and where are the Americans that I'm here to see? And he walked back through the door we had just walked through together and locked it. So I'm in a courtyard with a whole bunch of guys, cookies, cigarettes, and magazines. And in a, in a flash, three guys come running over to me and say in, in American accented English, are you the consul? Are you the consul? And I say, yeah. They said, don't worry, we'll take care of you. And we then they escorted me to someplace more private than that. And they were nice to me even before they knew I had treats for them. And I thought to myself, wow, good life lesson. Show no fear. Every consular officer has a million and one stories to tell. But I I do think that that was uh, something that, um, you know, I certainly never forgot. So kind of thinking about that more broadly, what do you see as the role of the consul today? You've no doubt seen our passports before. And the U.S. passport has something that I think is quite unique. Uh, It may not be the only uh, passport that has this, but it says right there on the very first page that the Secretary of State of the United States of America hereby requests all whom it may concern to permit the citizen slash national of the United States named herein to pass without delay or hindrance, and in case of need, to give all lawful aid and protection. That's sort of the creed of the consul. This passport is among the most valuable documents uh, on the planet because it is a passbook to every bit of assistance that is lawful and appropriate for the government of the United States to do to help an American citizen abroad. Uh, So that is number one. And it is the number one mission of the Department of State. Consuls also adjudicate visas for people who would like to immigrate or travel to the United States on a temporary basis. Since the uh, horrific attacks of 9-11, I think the rest of the government and other agencies of government uh, came to realize what we who do consul work always knew, that we also have a pretty vital role with respect to the security of the nation. We are the people who see and interview people in their home country, in their own language, and we understand such things as the push and pull factor of sort of the economics of it, why somebody might want to come to the States and in fact uh, stay, even though they're telling us they're planning a trip to Disney World. We also uh, access information, data, provided by other agencies so that we can, A, know who we're talking to, and B, know whether or not any other agency of our government regards that person as a person of interest, uh, as somebody who should not be allowed to come to the United States. So so we are an important part, and even one of the very first parts of the Homeland Security equation. And of course, the third part of what we do is we're the ones who issue these passports. So the adjudication of a passport application is not because we're nosy. It's just because we want to make sure that only those who who qualify for those get those. So you mentioned 9-11, and that seems like a pretty big sort of watershed moment in the history of U.S. foreign policy. But how has the role of consul changed over your time in the foreign service, either related to 9-11 or maybe not related? I'll answer it two ways. That the role of consular officers... Uh, just continues to grow, as we've alluded to already, uh, in the, you may not have seen a particular problem before, but once you've seen it once, uh, we know we'll see it again somewhere else. And so our own skill set sort of grows uh, to meet the needs of the American traveling public. When you think about your 19th century travelers, they, you know, there were a lot of um, issues related to uh, seamen and sailors, Right. Some of the tasks that consuls had to do had had everything to do with, you know, that sort of the commerce and the behavior and the whatever adventures befell American citizens in that way. 
I remember living in Madrid and uh, receiving a ship to shore phone call. I mean, Madrid is decidedly not on a coast, right? And a, a captain wanted me to perform a, a particular function for him. And I was, I was intrigued because he was so certain that I could do this thing. And I said, sir, you, you have me at a disadvantage, I have to admit, because you are speaking so you know cogently and with su- such familiarity and authority with a thing I have never heard of. He gave me the Foreign Affairs Manual site. Foreign Affairs Manual, we call it FAM. He said, you know, go to the FAM. And he gave me the site and, and there it was. So here I am in, in, in a landlocked place performing a function for this guy who's done it a million times before. He just had never heard of it. You know, so you always have to suspend disbelief a little bit and realize that, you know, um, if it's a rule or a reg, it's going to be in the fam or law. And, you know, uh, you swallow your pride and say, okay, I'm ready. Now, on a more serious note, I think quite honestly that the 9-11 attacks created the, the most profound change in how we do consular work and how others, even within the Department of State, as well as the interagency community, perceive what consular work is. The World Trade Center was attacked in 1993. It was a serious attack, but nowhere near the level uh, of what obviously happened those many years later. Uh, but Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman uh, engineered something that I, in all candor now, wish our entire nation and security apparatus and intelligence apparatus had realized was um, something to be taken seriously and for our eye never to be taken off that, you know, that particular ball. But things, things happen that sometimes we only realize in retrospect had a, a little bit more uh, of a meaning than we realized at the time. So anyway, before the September 11th attacks, I think my consular brethren and, and friends would agree with me that consular work was done professionally, uh, but it was not always seen as, um, what shall I say, um, an integral part of the sort of bilateral relationships that we engaged in. So an embassy's consular section was expected to sort of run well, be predictable, um, be service oriented, both for host government authorities and, and citizens, as well as for American citizens who needed us. And it was in the main, it was that after September 11th, lots of things happened at the same time. But I will say with respect to consular work, that uh, here in Washington, D.C., as you know, you're here too, we tend to want to have easy answers to really hard questions. Whose fault is that? Whatever that is. But as we're talking about 9-11, very early on, within hours maybe, um, people had focused on how the hijackers received visas. And so that was an answer some people were were content to to stop with. Well, if they'd never gotten visas, this never would have happened. Who issued the visas? The then Assistant Secretary uh, of Consular Affairs was named uh, Ambassador Mary Ryan, an iconic figure in the Foreign Service and much loved uh, as well. Mary, right from the outset, said that we we must look at everything that we do, of course, but know this. This was an, an intelligence failure. That wasn't um, well received by some folks, but the 9-11 Commission actually, some time after that, wrote a, just a riveting report that pointed to the fact that a failure to share information among agencies uh, certainly was a part of this, just an extraordinary, regrettable, would, would that we could do one thing differently moment we would make sure that we all knew what one of us knew. So the focus that I already mentioned to, to you about us as a sort of the, some people use a phrase I don't like, but it, it does give you an image, as sort of the pointy tip of the spear out there in the place. If the traveler wants to come to America and do America harm, we have that moment 
to um, to stop it, drawing on information before 9-11 that we didn't always receive. So we became a part of conversations we perhaps would not have been in earlier days uh, in the consular service. It's also the case that, um, and understandable, that uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 saw things like the creation of the, of the Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security, saw a lot of new legislation, and a lot of it aimed at um, uh, changing how we actually performed our functions with respect to um, visa interviews, iterations of, of many kinds. I do not question at all, why those things needed to be done, why Congress did what it did. But there was a a byproduct of that, which was the predictability. You get an appointment, you know, we're going to, we're able to tell you when your appointment is, uh, how long it's going to take, more or less, and um, and when should we decide, yes, uh, should we decide that you qualify for that visa, um, how long that's going to take to get it to you. And that really matters to people who are in every walk of life. You're a scientist coming to a conference. You're anybody coming to a conference. You're uh, the ranking person in the Marriott Corporation in country X, and you're coming for something with all of the other ranking, with all of your counterparts from everywhere, because that was one walk of life, the travel and tourism industry, that greatly suffered as our predictability was greatly impacted by new procedures and by... uh, Things we just had to learn to do differently, master, and then sort of uh, apply to all of our embassies and consulates all around the world, and lots of uh, lots of stuff, lots of retraining, lots of continuing scrutiny of the uh, of us of the function. This is not a complaint; it's an observation. We were under a microscope. I'll put it that way. We got better over time. We turned it around, but whether it was the American academic community, the travel and tourism industry, the business community, people who simply had um, a visa case in progress and, and their fiance couldn't make it here. couldn't We couldn't process that quickly enough for people. So the service standards lagged while our security profile was greatly enhanced and, and remains that way to this day. Uh, the service orientation of the people who do consular work never lagged. It it hurt our hearts when we realized that some of the things that we were not able to do as quickly as we once could, th- our goal was to get back. Our goal was to get back in the game in a way that really mattered. You, you're an academic. You surely know this. Uh, and you may not like my use of this vocabulary, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry bringing foreign students to the United States, right? And think of every industry and the hit that everybody took until we got this right again. I earlier spoke about pre-9-11 world when consular work was not necessarily thought of as sort of the, the cutting issue of bilateral relationships. Well, what happened to everybody else in the State Department was all of a sudden they could go to no meeting anywhere in the world or in the city with a foreign counterpart without having to have a conversation about visas. It became uh, everybody's number one thing. On the one hand, people are saying, get those visas going. Are you out of your minds? Do you know what it's costing America? And others saying, hey, you know, uh, are you sure that you understand the security needs of our country? So we coined a phrase then, which I think they actually still use. And we described our efforts as secure borders and open doors. I like that. All of our interlocutors in every walk of life, we hear you. It was important that it be secure borders first and open doors second. And we we get that, you know, we're, we're, we're no less interested. We are as interested or more interested in uh, the protection of our, you know, our nation and our citizenry uh, as, as everybody else involved in these important issues. So I want to pivot to thinking about sort of women in the foreign service and, you know, you yourself are a career foreign service officer. You mentioned some 
people that you've worked with who rose pretty high in the ranks to, you know, within the State Department. So how do you see, aside from going into a prison where you're the only small female in a, a group of 300 men, um, how do you see your role as a woman, maybe your identity as a woman, impacting the work that you have done? Or or has it impacted the work that you have done? It wasn't until sort of the mid to late 70s that a woman could be married and continue to serve as a foreign service officer. I came in in 1981. So that just gives you a little bit of a sense of there was still stuff going on that needed to change. But when George Shultz became Secretary of State and was assembling his team, he named a woman named uh, Ambassador Roz Ridgway to be the Assistant Secretary of State for what was then the Bureau of European and Canadian Affairs. And if you understand that uh, the prominence of the regional bureaus is pronounced, and the European and Canadian Affairs Bureau was the, you know, the capo di tutti capo. I mean, it's just first, first in show, best in show. And here comes George P. Schultz, uh, at that point, three-time cabinet member. This would be his fourth, his sex date, and puts a woman in charge. And she, uh, no nonsense, extremely talented. That, I, I still feel in my ears now that I can hear the glass shattering, Right as an enormous thing had happened. When Secretary Schultz was uh, uh, turning uh, 90, his staffers had a dinner for him and we we all put together, we put together a little scrapbook of stuff. And we were each given a page just to say what we remembered best and most about him. And I wrote my stuff and there were lots of, well, there were several things in it, but one of them was, when you chose Roseanne Ridgway to be the Assistant Secretary for European and Canadian Affairs, you changed the vista and you changed our futures because you we saw something we'd never seen before. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, we can do those things. The numbers, I think, wax and wane. We're nowhere near parity. Uh, in, in big jobs in the State Department, even today, if anything, I think we've taken us some steps back. But I do know that uh, you can't keep them down on the farm after they've seen Perry. You know? And there are extraordinary colleagues uh, of, of you know, uh, men and women who I have been delighted to serve with, uh, sometimes to be mentored by, sometimes to mentor. But we still have work to go. We have you know, work to do in making sure that um, diversity and inclusion values that we espouse around the world need to be modeled here, too. Yeah, that's a great point. So um, I know that most mostly consuls deal with Americans or people who want to come to America. But is there ever a time when the consular service might get involved in women's issues or women's rights throughout the world. Have you ever been a part of anything like that? As a mid-grade officer running something called the Office of Overseas Citizen Services, um, then Assistant Secretary Ryan asked me to look at the office. It was, I don't know, probably 80 some odd people. uh, And the, the design of the office seemed to be ripe for a modernization. And so I did that. In in those days, the office had almost sort of a sort of an emergency. It had a citizens' emergency center where you know that was fast twitch. You know, this is a sprint. You got to something has happened. We got to react. We got to fix it. We gotta blah blah blah. And then um, slow twitch. And these are the marathoners. Um, uh, these are the people who are sort of working on cases that go on for a long time. Um, and uh, so anyway, we changed the office a lot. But one of the things that we did in changing it was we created an office of children's issues. And that office uh, was sp- specifically geared toward uh, intercountry adoptions, helping Americans in that way, and international parental child abductions. I started that office with four people in Maybe it was 1993, I think. Um, 
There are over 100 people in that office now. And that's a reflection of lots of things. Uh, Americans travel more, Americans marry um, uh, people from different countries more. Um, sometimes those marriages don't always survive, just like Americans married to Americans sometimes see their marriages not survive. But there are often children involved. And the whole question of international parental child abduction um, was was one that we uh, we have surged to to work on. I can think of so many cases. This happens all over the world. But some of the travel, it's harder. It's harder for an American citizen whose former husband or estranged husband will not give permission to allow her to enter the country to see her children or to plead her case. So that was a um, big part of my uh, my entire tour as CA Assistant Secretary. It was really visas and international parental child abduction. Now, it's not always the dad who is the taking parent, of course, I hasten to, to say, but, but Many of the cases that I remember so profoundly uh, were that. Can I tell you one specific story? We had a number of cases uh, in in Jordan. I would I should say several. No, I don't want to make it seem like it was a it was a, uh, a gigantic number, but we had several cases in Jordan, and I had gone to Chicago to do a town hall meeting with parents who, what we used to call left behind parents, with parents whose children had been taken by their uh, foreign spouse somewhere else. And uh, I, I met at that town hall meeting a woman whose three children had been taken to Jordan. Um, I'll try and be very careful not to give any identifiers of any kind. Anyway, we chatted at the end of the town hall and I mentioned to her that I was going to Jordan specifically to work on some of the cases. I was aware of her case. And she asked me um, if she could uh, send me some presents because she hadn't seen her children in 10 years. And so I took those presents and, uh, and off I went to Jordan with, uh, with another colleague. And we talked to various ministers of government. And, you know, uh, in one case, I showed a minister of government the photos, the last photos that this woman had given me uh, copies of. Um, and the children were 10 years older than these photos now. Yeah. And they were taken when they were very little. So I asked him if this minister of government could, was there a way that he could possibly arrange a visit? I said, I. It hurts my heart to know that this is happening. I can't imagine what it feels like to endure this. Right? And um, I didn't think I got a lot of traction. He said he'd think about it. But uh, in the car ride to our next meeting, he, he called me. And he said, um, can you go? And he named a town not too far out of Amman, which is where we were. Can, can you go and meet the mayor of this town? And I said, uh, yes, certainly, uh, I'll call him. He said, no, I mean, can you go right now? And this town was pretty close to where these children were living. So we did. The mayor turned out to be a guy who was, he looked like he was 12 years old. I wasn't even sure. I didn't know who I was talking to. And, it, and so I'm, you know, just talking in you know, broad terms. I don't I want to ask the right person for what I want, right? And he says, no, I'm the mayor. We, we'll make this happen. But um, I'd like to send you with a police escort. And I said, great. I said, oh, my gosh. I didn't know this was going to happen today. I don't have a camera. I, I have to go back to my hotel and get a camera. He said, no. He gives me a photographer. And so with a police escort and a photographer far more talented than I would be, off we go. We just literally knock on the door of the house where these three children live. And the... Um, the father wasn't home, but his his mother his mother was, their grandmother, and she let me in. They greeted me very hospitably. The father arrived a few minutes later in high dudgeon. We went to their living room where his American college diploma was hanging on the wall, and we we were there for about five hours. One of the children, the oldest child, was a poet. She read some of her poetry for us. I gave them the presents from their mom. I asked if the uh, 
dad would be amenable to mom visiting? He said, yes. Uh, I called mom from my hotel room that night, and I don't know which one of us cried more. I told her I had 72 pictures that this Jordanian cameraman had uh, had taken, and I would FedEx them to her as soon as I got back to the United States. She said, no, God, no. She lived in Chicago. She drove to Washington, D.C. because she didn't want to run the risk that the photos might be lost in the mail. There were so many cases like that. You know, this is, this is not a consular heart on a sleeve. This is a human being's heart on a sleeve, right? For everybody in, in that case and all of the cases that we had, you asked sort of a women's issue. Um, I can't help but bring my personal perspective to this. And I do believe that the majority of cases were that were so very difficult. Um, you know, that's some of the toughest stuff we do. And I'm really proud to say that the four people who staffed that office for me when I first set it up and the hundred plus who are there now are all volunteers. Nobody gets dragooned into that office because you know that uh, the stakes are so very high that um, th- there's not there's not so much wiggle room there. You either get your child back or or you don't. We either help you get your child back or we fail. And that's uh, meaning that the highs in that office are astronomically high and the lows are just equally as devastating. But you never stop. You just never stop. And that's keeping faith with the American people. That's showing them, as we do in, in disasters and all sorts of things, where we you know, basically don't wave this in your face and say it, but we believe this. You have this. I am going to pull out all the stops I have to make sure that we can uh, do our best. Maura, thank you so much for being willing to talk to us about the consular service today and about its impact on women. I learned a lot. And that's all for this bonus episode of Consolation Prize. Consolation Prize is a podcast of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. This episode was produced by me, Abby Mullen. Special thanks to our guest, Maura Hardy. Our music is, as always, by Andrew Cody. We'll be back in a few weeks with a new episode in our regular style. In the meantime, thanks for listening.